So Kentucky is number one for air pollution. The article just came out, Business Week, Courier Journal, they reported it. So number one for air pollution, it's not really news, but uh, Kentucky is owned by King Coal. We're a coal state. We are a beggar sitting on uh, a throne of gold. Um, so we're on a throne of gold and we're a beggar, but we're not actually tapping into the coal resources. It's the people's coal. It's the so-called commonwealth of Kentucky. We live in a so-called commonwealth. It's not for the people. It's for king coal, for the private corporations, which come in here and suck all the industries and suck all the resources and pay our employees the least amount as possible. They have not been investing in alternative energy, so when those jobs go, they're gone for good. And um, the, the increase of natural gas is making coal a dying industry. Uh, and there's a lot of pollution that's going on, so there's no regulation whatsoever here in Kentucky. Uh, coal companies run free reign over Kentuckians, and there's very little thing, very little that Kentuckians do to stop it. A uh, big problem here in Louisville is you got a coal ass pond, and it persists around an LG&E power plant. LG&E is the electric company um, which uh, people use here in Louisville. So this is a Wave3.com story by John Bull. And uh, here's, here's the article. So it's a big dusty dump that's been building for decades on the bank of the Ohio River. It's a coal ash from LG&E's Cane Run Power Plant. A year ago, neighbors complained of the health effects. His allergy doctor is one that made the comment we need to move, said parent Stephanie Hogan, referring to her two-year-old son with asthma. Tumors just came back on Brittany Heiser's eight-month old son. The whole right side of his face is right eye socket and lesion above his left eye. Uh, and they said that the, one of the main reasons the cancer reoccurs is the environmental pollutants. It's creating um, cancerous conditions for a baby. So her whole neighborhood is getting a crash course in environmental pollution already. LG&E has been fined twice by air pollution control, $22,500 and $24,000 for coal ash blowing beyond the cane run generating plant. And in April 25th press release, LG&E announced it would control dust potential by installing a dust screen. The dust screen is an example of something we're doing above and beyond to do anything we can, said Chris Whelan, an LGE spokesperson. It's a 50 foot tall, 223 foot long screen. So how's that working out? Uh, we've been watching, neighbors have been watching repeatedly in May, June, and July. Neighbors record video of dust flying over and around the net. Sometimes it looks like a tornado swallows up the screen. Sometimes like on June 1st, it looks like a wild uh, wildfire blackout. Greg Walker has a dusty front row seat where he, where he records flying coal ash. Walker said he could predict when it's going to blanket his house by watching the weather and how often they water the ash pile. It's aggravating that the kids can't have their toys out or anything, said Walker. Everything gets covered with dust. You can wash your car and a day or two later it's covered with dust. And it wasn't meant to be the end-all solution, Whelan said. We got the watering trucks, added soil and seed, done all the steps. What else can we do to help the neighbors? It has a windbreak to help contain the dust. Neighbors are just as angry with air pollution control, even though it has levied 46000 in fines. They contend that it's nickel and dime stuff for, for a company as large as LG&E. You could argue that, but this is what our regulations provide, said Air Pollution Control District Spokesman Thomas Nord. The residents say the screen's a joke. I won't call it a joke because I don't want to be glib, said Nord, but I have said, and I'll say it again, the net was not part of any compliance plan we, I, we asked LG&E to do. Now that's being documented, men are wondering if the blowing ash is a health hazard when Heiser's son is not in chemo treatment. He's not playing in the yard either. We don't let him go outside very much, period, because we don't want him getting sick, said Heiser. So if we go outside, we have to take him all the way to the zoo or to the park for 30 minutes. We're not health experts, said Whelan. The EPA sets the standards and the APCD enforces them. There's not been any violation of these health standards. We have amb ambient air monitors all over Jefferson County, and there's been no violation of these standards. We don't have an opinion on that because we don't have the science either way. Our position is, regardless of what is or what isn't doing to people's health, it's a situation that can't continue, says Nord. Okay, so lg and has got a coal ash plant here in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, there's also a coal ash plant in Gent, Kentucky, so on the border of Gallatin and Carroll County. So if they shut this down, they might be shipping... Um, all their garbage up to Gent, up to Northern Kentucky. Um, 
So again, um, uh, the new articles are coming out. You got LG and E Coash Pond, which are you know uh, a huge hindrance to the neighbors. And uh, Kentucky is number one for air pollution. Kentucky is number one for air pollution, which isn't a surprise. We knew that Kentucky was number one for air pollution. Kentucky has been number one for air pollution um, for quite some time. So it's not new information. Just like the information came out that 25% of Kentucky's children are poor, this is not new information either. Uh, Kentucky children has been, one out of four has been poor for quite some time. And if you look at the uh, free and reduced lunch rates in the schools, it's at 50%. So that suggests that the children are, uh, there's more than just 25% of the children are poor. Plus you have the census that just came out that said 50% of Americans are poor. Um, if you double the poverty line. So, the, uh, again, they, they just, uh, new information that come out that goes ahead and reaffirms knowledge that had already been out there previously. Kentucky was number one for pollution. Kentucky is still number one for pollution. Uh, new information came out that 25% are poor. We've always been poor. Uh, but, it, again, it's not news. In fact, Kentucky is number one for a lot of things, a lot of really poor um, uh, poor shitty statistics. Uh, we're number one for prisons, number one for the fastest growing prisons. So the state of Kentucky is building new prisons. That's how we're going to solve the, you know, the, uh, the craziness that you see in Kentucky since Kentucky is also number one for insanity and America is number one for insanity. So Kentucky is the number one state and the number one country for insanity. So we top that list. And they're building new prisons when every dollar that you spend in education will save a dollar for your prisons later on. Are we investing in more in our education or more for our prisons? Uh, we're number one for the fastest growing prisons. We're number one for the highest prisoner rate per capita. So we get, we're putting more people in prisons. We're building more prisons faster than anybody else. We're putting people in prison faster than anybody else. Uh, we're the number one for child deaths and child abuse cases, so we're, we're beating up our kids until they die the fastest. Um, we're also number one for elder and spousal and animal abuse, so violence all around. It's all Hat Hatfield and McCoys around here. It's been violent ever since, in America, since 1492, but in Kentucky since 1792 when we became a state, or before then, um, when all the Indians were being exterminated. The Chickasaw, the Cherokee, the Shawnee, so... Uh, uh, it's been violent for a very long time. No surprise that uh, we have a police brutality. Um, so I don't, you know, chicken or the egg, which one started first? I don't know. Uh, I think the government should serve as the example and when they're showing us that violence is the way that you keep and maintain order. It, it seems to justify it, and I think the households emulate the state. And so when the state says that a fascist police dictatorship is the best way to uh, live and to keep order, then that's what these households are doing. So that's what these uh, uh, dictating fascist Nazi moms and dads are doing too. So Kentucky is number one for child deaths and child abuse cases, animal abuse, elder abuse, spousal abuse, number one for fastest growing prisons, number one for air pollution, number one for prisoners per capita, number one for toothlessness, we ain't got any teeth. Our teeth are being rotted out. We're drinking too much Mountain Dew, drinking too much sweet tea. We're not uh, brushing our teeth. We're not going to the dentist. We um, have really poor health. We got a lot of fat people. Over 30% of the adults are fat. Over 35% of the kids are fat. So lots of obesity. Number one in the state for, uh, number one in America for insanity. Number one for cancer, which I think is probably the most appalling. Uh, uh, number one statistic. We, we shouldn't be number one in anything, right? We shouldn't. We win the gold medal and all these things. This buffet. We got a buffet of problems. We got. No wonder Kentucky is such a shithole. No wonder Kentucky is uh, on, on the bottom of the, all the rankings when it comes to health care and education and wealth. We got a host of problems. We have a whole buffet of problems and kind of good for any good person organizers who want to get out there because it's an organizer's dream to have so many problems out there. We need more good people. We need more occupiers. We need more people who's actually caring about the community and coming up with different plans and joining in the discussion. So so speak up, Kentucky. We need we need more people to speak up. Um, um, you know, so number one for pollution, number one for a lot of these uh, horrible statistics. Uh, there's some other some other uh, things that's going on in Kentucky. So, uh, some domestic violence in Pulaski County. A Pulaski County man was shot by police Thursday as he apparently shot and killed his estranged wife, um, who had faced several domestic violence allegations. So, the woman who died, Amanda, 
or Mary Amanda Hislope had said in one 2010 case that she didn't want to pursue an assault charge against Timothy K. Hislope. So Timothy K. Hislope was shot um, because he had shot and killed uh, Mary Amanda Hislope in Pulaski County, Kentucky. I don't foresee any future problems between Timmy K. Hislope and myself, she said, because they no longer live together, Mary Hislope said in a handwritten note in the court file. Authorities found Mary Hislope, 44, dead in a house in the Nancy community after police had a short standoff with Timmy Hislope on Thursday. The shootings happened after police went to investigate a 911 call in which someone at the house was screaming for help, said Trooper Don Trosper, a state police spokesman. When they arrived just after 10 a.m., Mary Hislope came to the door, followed by Timmy Hislope. He pulled her back inside, and then police heard what appeared to be a gunshot, according to a news release. So the police came to the house, and then he shot her. So um, I don't, I don't want to say the police caused it, uh, but they did shoot. He did shoot her right after the police had come to the door. So Timmy Hislope, 52, then came back outside and after a short standoff, pointed his gun at police. The news release says an officer shot Hislope in the torso. Hislope was flown to the U. Uh, K. Chandler Medical Center for Treatment. The hospital said they had new information about his condition Thursday night. Mary Hislope said in one 2007 court document that her husband, who had been drinking heavily, had broken things in the house, pushed her, and threatened to kill her and anyone who tried to take him to jail. In December 2010, Timmy Hislope slapped his wife, causing bruises and minor injuries, according to a citation. Police charged him with fourth degree assault. However, Mary Hislope said that she didn't want to pursue charges. She said she was not in fear for her life or being pressured to make the statement. Timmy Hislope also was cited in a domestic violence petition in 1998 and charged with public intoxication in 2010. So that verifies the fact that we have all this domestic violence, spousal abuse, there's animal abuse, there's child abuse. So um, Kentucky is a violent state. It's been violent for uh, quite some time. Uh, Andrew Jackson even said, pointed out that every Kentuckian has a gun a flog of whiskey and a deck of cards. So gun, whiskey, and cards. That's that's what Andrew Jackson thought of when he thought about the Kentuckians. So Kentucky, that's um you know, some some that's one story of the violent abuse that happens here. Another one, Louisville lawyers pursuing claims at Jefferson County Public school staff and teachers failed to stop bullying, and he brought the alleged victims and their families to talk about the case. Days after filing a suit over a boy who was left hanging by a shirt in a bathroom, Ted Gordon said Tuesday he had filed three more suits, claiming school administrators were negligent and failing to protect three more children from bullies. The Courier Journal was not able to verify the three suits uh, had been formally entered late Tuesday afternoon. One case involved a girl in seventh grade at Lazater. Uh, middle school dr uh, drafted a suit said she was waiting at the, her bus stop when six boys pushed her down and stole her cell phone. Her mother, Crystal Bennett, said after the hearing about the incident that she called the school's principal, Jonathan Sesler, and assistant principal, Kevin Peek, multiple times to complain about the bullying. But two months later, it happened again, the complaint said. This time it was worse. The complaint said the same six boys pinned her down, tore her clothes, and sexually assaulted her. So the school uh, administration knew about the bullying, didn't do anything about it, and it continued, and it happened again. Um, some, some words about bullying. Um, I thought it was outrageous that if you were a good person and you got into a fight, if you were hit and you hit back, you would be suspended along with the bully. They had a no-tolerance policy. Well, that's not good for anybody who is good and does and wants to live by the rules and do what they're supposed to do. Whether they're just supposed to take a beating if they're being picked on and followed by you know other folks and they start getting beat up, they're just supposed to take a beating. And what happens if they do take a beating? They just take a hit and nobody's there to witness it. Does that mean they don't get suspended? Does that mean that it will just be one person's word versus the other? Just like this case right here, six boys beat up this woman. She says, or this young girl, and this uh, young girl said that she, um, you know, got beat up by these boys and got her cell phone stolen, and then they sexually assaulted her. So, um, had they done something to enforce or to do, you know, to stop the bullying, but they don't do it. And I think school administrators, or, uh, administrators don't do it because they're bullies themselves. They're the oppressors. They only know how to tell the kids to shut up and sit down. And they all collectively do it. It's a political. Uh, power. It's a political group. Karl Marx said the definition of political power is when one group oppresses another group. So when the oppressors in the school are oppressing the oppressed, it's hard for them to be able to see the bully since they themselves are the bully. 
Uh, that's in addition to also uh, doing something fair. If a person is being picked on and they stand up for themselves and they hit the bully back, that person's a hero. They should not be suspended. That's exactly what they should do. That's what the educators and the parents and everybody should be teaching um, the kids to stand up for themselves. Don't allow anybody to pick on them. Don't instigate trouble, but don't accept it either. So, um, more Kentucky news coming up.